it's great to be back, right? I've been, I've been traveling all over the place. I've, I've gone out to Minot and to Stanley and Williston, and I'm heading to, I think, Beaver Creek uh, next week. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun preaching in different places, but it's, it's really good to be back, and uh, it's great that you're here. And, you know, there's a lot of people that come out to our church for Lenten services. A lot of the congregations I've served, we've not been uh, real well attended, and it's encouraging that there's so many people here and, and uh, reflecting on the, the journey to the cross. So um, with that, if the congregation would please rise for our call to worship this, after, this, this evening. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Well, let us sing together hymn number 407, Jesus Paid It All. Just a reminder as we're getting close to wrapping up Lent, uh, we'll have one more normal Lenten service with the meal uh, next week, and then the week after that is Holy Week, so we will not be having a Lenten uh, service or meal on Wednesday. However, um, as our tradition has been uh, the last few years, for Monday, Thursday, so that's the day before Good Friday, that's oftentimes where we celebrate the Last Supper that Jesus uh, had with his disciples. 
and we'll just have a, a, a light meal, a, a potluck, um, and then what we're going to do is, what we've been doing is, is having communion at the tables, and, and it's a little less formal. Um, I'll be talking a little bit uh, more about communion and the Passover and what Jesus Christ was doing and the linking of the old covenant to the new covenant, uh, where, where Jesus says, this is the new covenant, and he held up the bread and he broke it and he held up the wine and he said, this is my blood and, and with the bread, this is, this is my body. And uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about that and, and I'll be going over that. And then Good Friday, we're going to be having um, a, 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 almost a community service. The, the pastors where we meet at, in my office on Wednesday morning, uh, we gather together and pray every, every week. And that's been a wonderful experience. And uh, we are, are going to be doing a, a community service with them as well. Also, Pastor Jim Booth will be here. Pastor uh, Darren Peterson will be here from the Assemblies of God and Jim from the Baptist Church. And then um, Pastor Isaiah will be here from New Hope. And then Jonathan will be here as well from Youth for Christ. And we'll all be taking part in the service. And that'll be Good Friday. And that will be at 7 o'clock. And then obviously we'll be having Easter Sunday service after that. And the men, we're going to be doing a uh, breakfast. And uh, we're going to be... Uh, hopefully making some good food. So uh, don't eat breakfast on Easter morning, but please come out to the church a little early. Uh, We won't be having our normal adult Sunday school or children's Sunday school, but we will be having a very relaxed time of just food and fellowship and just really visiting, and it's a a great time had by all. So uh, just a few things to look forward to. Also, as I've been working with the uh, confirmation class, uh, one of their requirements is to share their testimonies in a public way. And um, they, uh, they haven't done them yet, but uh, I'm assured that we're going to have uh, at least one testimony next week, right, Jeremiah? You said you're going to do it, so we're looking forward to that. So uh, Jeremiah is going to share his testimony next Wednesday, so please come for that. Uh, there might be other students that will be sharing as well. And, um, and the other students, if they don't share during Lent, they'll have opportunities during our Sunday morning services. Are there any other announcements that we need to highlight? All right. Well, um, the scripture lesson's a little bit longer, so uh, feel free to remain in your seats. Uh, Our epistle lesson this evening is from the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But to Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, for you never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband." Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Our, our gospel lesson, which is the basis for this evening's message, is found in Luke chapter 22, verses 63 through 71. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, The council of the elders of the people, both the chief priest and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. 
And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. And then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. You you can remain seated as we continue our worship by singing hymn number 72, What Wondrous Love Is This? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, for tonight's message, I'm going to be focusing on a very short section of the text from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Verse 66 says this, When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. Now, to provide some background to this verse, it's important to understand what has already happened to Jesus. As we know, Jesus was celebrating the Passover, and and he did something very radical when he held up the bread and he held up the wine, and he said, this is the new covenant, and another word for covenant could just be a a promise, a very deep promise, and and he said, this is my body, this is my blood, and no doubt the the disciples were curious. I mean, Jesus had said something similar in the past, and, and, and yet there was something very different because this was a special meal. They were celebrating the Passover, 
And after a, a meal, no doubt, they had, they had been busy the, the day earlier and, and they were walking around. They had been exercising a lot and, and night had come. They were full. They likely were very tired. And, and Jesus said, I, I need to go out and I need to pray. And he, and he took some of his closest friends with him and he said, please, pre, please pray for me. I'm going to go off into the garden and and as we know from the scriptures, Jesus was undergoing great stress because Jesus, as God, fully understood what was about to happen to him, that he was about to be arrested, uh, falsely accused, and then tried, and then murdered, killed on a cross. And, and then something very unique happened, medically speaking, because of the stress that, that he was going through. The, the, the tiny capillaries around his face started to burst and it mixed with the sweat. And the Bible says that, that great drops of blood poured from his face because of the stress. And he comes back and he, and he sees his friends and, and they're sleeping. He tries to wake them up, pray with me. He goes off and he prays again. And then the angry mob approaches at night, no doubt with torches, with clubs, with swords, with chains. And his friend Judas betrays him with a kiss. And Jesus is bound and led away. And when he was led away, the Bible says that, that he was um, taken to, to the chief priests, to the elders, to the scribes, and this was an illegal seizure. You know, the Jews, they, they had laws and rules and regulations that they had to follow. And this was not a legally called meeting. This was not legal, what they were doing to Jesus Christ. But they didn't care because they had an agenda. They knew what they needed to do with Jesus. And at, at this illegally called meeting, he was brutally beaten. He was mocked. He was questioned. And what did Jesus do? The Bible says that he remained silent up until he was asked one question, which is, are you the Christ? Are you the promised Messiah? Are you the Son of God? <laughs> and after Jesus basically says, yeah, that's me, <laughs> the chief priest, the high priest, tore his clothes out of anger and frustration and declared Jesus a heretic, a blasphemer, who needed to die for saying such a thing. And then strangely, you know, the, the, the text from Luke says that, that Jesus was taken to a, another meeting, a, a meeting that occurred at daybreak. Now this meeting, because it was during the day, would have been a, a legally called meeting. And you have to wonder, why take Jesus to two different meetings? Why try Jesus once illegally at night and now this supposed legal meeting during the day? Why bother with that? I mean, why didn't they just stone Jesus, right? I mean, do we remember when, when Jesus was preaching and teaching and he claimed to be one with the Father and it, it angered the Jews so much that they picked up stones to throw at Jesus but Jesus supernaturally just kind of walked right through them. Didn't give them the time of the day. Well, why didn't they just do something like that? Why bother going through this, this second meeting? Why bother following their customs and their rules now? What caused this blood-crazed crowd of religious elites to now want to bring Jesus before this legally called meeting? I believe it was because they wanted to have at least an appearance of doing what is right. You could say this, this fancy title of the, that I've been given, that they wanted to have a semblance of legality. They didn't really care if what they were doing was legal. They just wanted it to look good. They wanted it to look legal. They knew what they had done illegally at night was wrong. But they didn't care. They had an agenda. They had a plan. Jesus was going to pay for these claims of who he said he was. So why, again, have this meaning? Was it perhaps maybe as they wanted to cover all of their bases? I mean, let us not forget, Jesus rode into Jerusalem just a little bit ago on a donkey, and the crowds were going crazy. They were shouting, Hosanna! They were waving palm branches. They were taking their coats off and laying them down on, on the road for Jesus and his donkey to, to walk on. He was a popular rabbi. 
Maybe they thought, you know what? There are some people that like this guy. We got to make sure we do this right. And, and let's not forget, what about Nicodemus? Or what about Joseph, Joseph of, of Arimathea? What if they showed up? No, Jesus, Jesus, we needed to make sure that Jesus got what he deserved. They needed to make sure that Jesus got the sentence of death. They didn't really care if what they were doing was right. All they cared about was the end result that Jesus was declared guilty, stripped, humiliated in front of his followers, and eventually brutally killed on a cross. Have you ever really thought much about this sham trial? I mean, I've been a pastor for a while, and, and, you know, and I've just kind of read through this, and, oh, it's kind of interesting, there's this second trial. Well, why, why bother? Why bother having a semblance of legality, Right? Think deep about that. You know, in their heart of hearts, I believe that some, if not both, or most of them, knew what they were doing was evil and wrong. I mean, Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. In their minds, Jesus couldn't be the Messiah, right? It wouldn't be the kind of guy that Jesus was, would it? I mean, God wouldn't come to earth in the form of a baby and grow up in a middle class, a lower middle class, maybe even a poor family. I mean, Jesus' earthly dad was a carpenter. Come on, you know? I mean, and the Jews, they needed to convince themselves that, you know what, this is right. You know, we do need to get rid of Jesus. You know, after all, the Jews in their national history struggled with worshiping false gods. Most of their entire identity as Jews, that was what they struggled with. I mean, right now in in, in Sunday school, we're going through the book of Judges, right? And there's this constant cycle of of worshiping false gods. And then God says, fine, you want to worship a false god? I'll allow you to do that. And he withdraws himself. And then the people get themselves into bondage. And then they cry out, what have we done? And they repent. And then God sends them a judge or a prophet. and, And then things get better. And then the whole cycle repeats. Over and over and over again, the Jews struggled with worshiping the one true God. And by this time in their national identity, they finally figured out that there is but one God. And Jesus, no, Jesus wouldn't be that God, right? I mean, Jesus was from Nazareth. I mean, the Bible even quotes his own followers saying, nothing good comes from Nazareth. They couldn't accept the truth. It was, it was their, their patriotic duty, right? To rid the land of false prophets, of those that claimed to be the Messiah that they knew he couldn't be. It's been said that patriotism is the last refuge for scoundrels. And it's not wrong to be patriotic. I believe that, that I'm patriotic. I've, I've served in the military and, and I love my country. But, you know, there's a lot of evil deeds that sometimes are justified when we clothe ourselves on our country's flag and say that we're doing this for the greater good. We're doing this for our country. And it could be legally right. I mean, in our own country, let us not forget, is during World War II, if you were Japanese, maybe you were a nationalized American, but, but you had Japanese ancestry, What happened to you? They would seize you and forcibly put you in this internment camp and you were basically in a jail for the entirety of World War II because you looked like the enemy. It didn't matter if you were a patriotic American. You looked too much like the enemy. And early in our nation's life, when Andrew Jackson was the president, American Indians were forcibly had their land seized from them in the South. And maybe you've heard of it, but it's called the Trail of Tears. And it's when these American Indians were forced out of their land and told to go West. Thousands of them died on this forced march. And they lost what was legally theirs. Why? Because our president and our elected Congress decided that it was our right to take their land. And then later, Andrew Jackson decided to gift large tracts of land to select groups and people. 
which led to the rise and the need for plantations to be managed by slaves because they couldn't be run by one family. I mean, some of you come from big families, and you say, man, we, we had eight kids in our family, and they all helped out on the farm. Well, that's great. But when there was so much land in the South, one family, no matter how big, couldn't manage it. And as a result of, of Andrew Jackson and, and in our Congress doing what they did to the American Indians, some have speculated that that is what has led to the acceptance of slavery and one of the most deadly wars that we as a nation have ever fought. More people died in the Civil War than all of the other wars combined that were American. And it was legal. <laughs> Even today, right, our friends to the north of us in Canada, they, you know, they wanted to support the truckers. They say, yeah, this is right. You know, we're going we're gonna to give the truckers some of our money to, to pay for fuel because they're going to say that this is wrong. And their legally elected prime minister, along with their legally elected government, seized the money and froze the bank accounts of good people like you who were in Canada that simply gave money to help the truckers and a peaceful demonstration. And it's legal. It's patriotic. You know, the problem is not really patriotism. The problem is sin, because that's what's at our core. The problem is when we wrap ourselves in sin and claim it's something good like patriotism or our own free choice or something else. You know, our sinful nature is like a, like a pouting child that doesn't get his or her way and bangs on the table and screams, this is what I want. Feed me. Give me what I want. Forget what is right and wrong. Just give me what I want. That's who we are. That's our sinful nature. And sometimes we look at the people next to us and say, you bet, it. You bet. you're right, pastor. I know that person over there is sinful. <laughs> oh, man. Boy, you know, I've seen Dave Finstrom, right? I, that guy's a sinner, right? We can point to other people, but what about ourselves? We set up governments and institutions. We pass rules and laws and commands to, to guide and to restrain our sinful nature. And we say things like, as long as we follow the rules, we'll be okay. Don't question, don't disagree, just shut up and do what you're told. As long as we follow a semblance of legality, you'll be all right. As long as you do what appears to be right, then that's really what matters. <laughs> that's not what Jesus taught. And you know, it doesn't apply to just the other people, it applies to us. How many of us hold on to lies and call them truth? And we fool ourselves into thinking, well, I'm really a pretty good person. I'm following God's law really well. I don't vote for those bad people. I'm a registered this or a registered that. You know, I, I pray every day, Pastor. I'm not like those others. I go to church, even on special events like Lent. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir, right? You guys are dedicated Christians. But the problem is, if we start to think that that's what makes us better because we're doing these outward things, we're, we're, we're following something that's justifying our actions, that's giving us a semblance of legality, then in reality, there's no difference between us and those people who accused Jesus and tried him illegally. You know, the mark of a true Christian is a person who sees themselves for who they really are, Screwed up, bad. People that can't save themselves. You know, a Christian's not someone who works really hard at being a better person, and because of their efforts, they get to heaven. I mean, Martin Luther was real clear on that, right? That was kind of what, what kicked off the whole Protestant Reformation. It's not about our works. It's not about what we do, and because of our sinful nature, we've got to remind ourselves of that because we tend to revert back to that. A Christian is someone who recognizes their spiritual depravity, meaning that they are poor in spirit. They don't come to God saying, okay, God, here I am. 
You know, they come to God on their faces, raising their hands up, God, I don't have anything to offer you. All I can do is surrender. There's nothing in me that you should want, God. So what do we do with God's law as Christians? What do we do when we we want to strive to say, but you know, God has given us his law. God's law is good for us as Christians. It provides a, a, a guide to show us how to live our lives. But ultimately, what God's law is is a mirror. It shows us that we have fallen short, that we have bad tempers, that we do bad things, that we think things that we shouldn't think, we say things we shouldn't say, and yeah, occasionally even do things we shouldn't do. We're not the kind of people that we just need to knock off a little rust and put a little polish on, and we're good. What we need, Christians, is complete transformation. We come to God spiritually poor and say, God, here I am. I have a heart of stone, as the Bible says, that all of my deeds are as filthy rags. That's what I have to offer you. And God says, okay, what I'm going to do is make you perfect. What I'm going to do is purify you completely. I'm going to wash you in the blood of Jesus, and as a result, you will stand before me holy and pure and perfect, not because of your work, but because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news, that Jesus offers us complete transformation, not because of our goodness, not because of our ability to follow the law or, or, or being a, a good person or appearing to do what is right on the outside. We are perfect simply because Jesus was and is perfect. And in Christ's perfection, we can boldly live out our lives. Are we gonna sin? Yep. But your sin is covered in the blood of Christ. Christ. That's why we can, we can go to God and, and claim that wonderful promise in the scriptures that God's mercies are new every morning, every day. We can come to God and say, man, God, I wish I wouldn't have done this, but I did this. I did this again. God, forgive me. And he does. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus not only grants our faith, but he works that faith through us and finishes that faith out in us. There's a lot of seats that aren't filled tonight of good, godly people that have gone on ahead of us. The good news is is that Jesus promises to work out that faith, to be the perfecter of that faith. So take your heart And live your life trusting, not in the power of your ability to be a better person, to to strive to keep the law better, but, but live out trusting in the power of the forgiveness of God. And as we do that, we can experience freedom from a complete reality that we are perfect. Not a semblance, not a partiality, but a complete understanding that we are perfect, that we are holy, and that we are forgiven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the truth that even though we are sinful, even though we have nothing to offer you, Lord, you take us as we are. You cleanse us, you wash us, you perfect us, and you send us back out And you say, go and make disciples. Go and encourage others. Go and tell others about me. And as we fall on our faces and and struggle and don't do a good job, you pick us up, you clean us off, you wash us in the blood of, of you, Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. And you call us again to go and make disciples. Share the good news. Because one day, this world will be over. And together we will celebrate with you in heaven, Jesus. And we look forward to that. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and a power and a glory forever and ever. Amen. Would the congregation please rise for our closing hymn. We're going to sing hymn number 71, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen.